Thanks so much, Kara, and hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the webinar today. And uh, I'm uh, joined here, uh, as Kara mentioned, by Dr. Melissa Hortman. I'll allow her to just take a moment to introduce herself and her role at the Medical University of South Carolina. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on this presentation. Um, my name is Melissa Hortman. I'm the Director of Instructional Technology, as well as an Assistant Professor here at the Medical University of South Carolina. So I kind of wear two hats, an administrator role and a faculty role. So this topic is near and dear to my heart because it affects not only the way that I support individuals, but also the way that I myself um, develop and facilitate content to students. Thank you, Melissa. And as Kara mentioned, I'm John Scott. I am one of our product managers on the Blackboard Ally team. I work very closely with our user community. I've been uh, leading our Blackboard Ally tour. So I've been traveling around the world, meeting with institutions, colleges, universities about how they're implementing Blackboard Ally, as well as how they're thinking about universal design for learning and inclusive education. And I actually had the great fortune to visit Melissa at the Medical University of South Carolina back in April, and I got to see firsthand some of the amazing work that she's been doing. Um, but I wanted to start off uh, just in terms of the agenda here, thinking about personalized learning and learner preference. I think uh, really trying to ground Blackboard Allies' key features as a solution as really an effort to scale personalized learning. I'll dive a little bit into Blackboard Allies' key features just at a kind of high level. Uh, if anybody's interested in a more detailed demo uh, following the webinar, you, you know, please reach out or, or contact us at Blackboard Ally. We'd, we'd be happy to, to facilitate that. Then I'll pass it over to Melissa who can share really how they're driving a culture change around inclusive education at the medical university. We'll pause there for some questions and comments and then we'll dive into some data findings and we'll have more time for, for some interactive conversation. So just in terms of kind of how people think about personalized learning, you know, it's obviously a buzzword in education today. Um, and it really goes back a long time to, to studies like this one from, from Benjamin Bloom, which is, you know, often cited the Two Sigma problem, where they looked at, you know, the effects of one-to-one -one tutoring compared to group instruction. And so, you know, there were clear benefits to the one-to-one -one tutoring. If we think about it in the context of other educational theories, like Lev Vygotsky's theory of the zone of proximal development, when we can really cater instruction to one-to-one -to -one needs to those individual needs, we see great benefits to that. But of course, that doesn't scale very well. And so it's really been the goal of, of technologists for some time, and especially with the advent of artificial intelligence, to use these new emerging technologies to scale personalized learning. And so it really is a buzzword in ed tech today. And you hear it applied in lots of contexts. So things like adaptive release, where you're providing students options for self-pacing, for sequencing, how they move through an online course or a blended learning course. You have things like intelligent tutoring, where artificial intelligence is you know, trying to predict student needs and provide a very specific intervention or recommendation based on how other students you know, have, have um, performed in that context, performed in, in that particular situation. And, and while I think that these kinds of technologies, these kinds of uses of artificial intelligence are only going to increase in education and, and they're gonna play an important role in education in the future, one thing that I think that they don't necessarily do is teach students to be effective learners. So they're, they're very effective, let's say, in, in helping students master content uh, by providing very specific kinds of interventions, but they don't necessarily open up opportunities for students to develop effective learning practices. And so one of the areas that I like to think about um, is really around learner preference. So thinking about personalization as learner preference as opening up opportunities for student choice to really determine their own kind of learning pathway. And I think it's always important to make the distinction between learner preference and what we have uh, sometimes referred to as learning style. So there's obviously a lot of literature about learning styles. It's also never really been empirically validated, at least not uh, in repeatable studies. And so this idea that a student is uh, an oral learner or a visual learner or you know, learns better through kinesthetics 
um, that's also really a restrictive kind of pedagogy. It's, it's kind of pinning the student to a particular modality of learning. Whereas learner preference is really about trying to foster a kind of in active engagement with content, allowing them to be a conscious chooser and determiner of their particular learner pathway. And by doing that, we're actually fostering metacognitive awareness. So it's really helping students to think about how do I learn best or in what context is the most effective way for me to learn. And so this personalization as learner preference is also something that we see as really a key part of universal design for learning. And so the idea that when we represent learning content in different modalities and formats, uh, that we're activating different kinds of neurological pathways. So as we're listening to something versus as we're reading something, uh, we're really activating different kinds of learning processes. Of course, uh, when we do this, um, how, how UDL typically refers to metacognitive activity. They refer to it as executive function. So again, thinking about how do I command my own learning? How do I make sense of, of what works best for me? Um, and then, of course, when we think about learner preference, we can also think about supporting the diverse needs of our 21st century learners. I mean, we know that the population in higher education is rapidly changing. It's been changing for a long time. You know, students have different kinds of needs today. They have mobile needs. They're, they're learning more on the go. We have lots of adult learners who are returning to school who may have families. They may have jobs. And so how do we design learning experiences to support those kinds of diverse needs and how do we really give them options for how they engage with their course materials? And so Blackboard Ally, for those that are unfamiliar uh, with the tool entirely, it's been around for a couple of years now. It is an LTI solution, so it plugs uh, seamlessly, it integrates seamlessly into multiple learning management systems. And what it is really an accessibility tool, but one of its key features is automating the creation of what we call alternative formats. And so it makes, what it does is, is when it integrates into the learning management system, it uses machine learning and artificial intelligence to take, let's say the PDF that an instructor uploaded into the course and convert that into a number of different file formats. And so here, uh, because Dr. Hortman is, is on our uh, open LMS, uh, system. Uh, you can see the little ally icon next to the PDF file. And so when a student selects that icon, they will see this little ally window open up and they'll have a number of different formats uh, to download or to engage with based on, on the nature of that content, the nature of that file. And so for example, starting off with a, a scanned PDF, let's say an instructor has, has scanned a chapter from a book or an article uploaded into the learning management system. Now we know with a, something like a scanned PDF, we can't interact, we can't highlight it. It's not gonna work with any kind of text-to-speech technology. And so the first option student will have is to download an OCR PDF. We use Abby Fine Reader as an engine in the background to extract the text, try to clean up the, that font a little, provide a more readable document that is going to hopefully work a little bit better with assistive technologies. And so again, Ally is going to create these formats on demand, depending on the size of the file, the complexity of that file. It can take anywhere for a couple of minutes to, to, to generate. Once we generate it the first time for a student, we'll actually cache that and so that the next student that comes along will get an immediate download of that format. And so an OCR text is obviously critical for students who use a screen reader, but also other kinds of assistive technologies and study tools like a Kurzweil, for example. So that's the first format from that scanned PDF. From that scanned PDF, a student will also be able to download what we call our HTML format. So this is going to be a mobile friendly format. It's gonna be responsive to the screen size. So if you've ever tried to read a PDF on your phone and you're pinching and zooming, it's a really distracting experience. It's going to affect how well students are able to engage in and read a text. For those mobile learners downloading the HTML format, they can zoom in nice and tight on there, have a nice clean scroll. That's our HTML format. 
We'll produce an EPUB format. So for students who are on a tablet or who just want to have a more interactive experience, being able to customize fonts, especially for those students who may have dyslexia. Let's say the, the original content item has a font, it's a serif font. Very difficult for students with dyslexia to read that kind of a font. They can customize and change it to a non-serif font. They can change the background, change the contrast highlight, annotate, really engage deep reading practices with an EPUB. And again, we started here with a scanned PDF that the student really had very limited options for engagement with. We'll also produce an electronic Braille format. So for students who use a refreshable Braille display, as you see pictured here, they can actually have a tactile reading experience. We hear students talk about uh, students with, with uh, visual impairments who uh, may you know, they're used to listening to a screen reader all day long. They suffer from, from hearing fatigue. They want to switch up the modality, having that tactile reading experience. Also a great way for those students to develop uh, better spelling because they're actually feeling the structure of the text, the structure of the words, and that's our electronic Braille format. We'll also produce MP3s of the content. And so for those students that are on the go that want to listen to the content in the car, on the commute, or while exercising, or again, even if they just want to switch up the sensory modality for which they're engaging that content, they can download an MP3. And we'll actually, uh, based on the language of that, that, that document, the voice will read out uh, in, a, in a particular accent for that content. So if it's a Spanish language document, let's say it's a student, they're taking a Spanish course, they're English speaking, taking a Spanish course, they wanna work on their pronunciation, they wanna you know, hear how the words sound, they can download a Spanish audio, listen to that content. So that's our MP3. Text. What is literacy? Begin paragraph text. text. And finally, we'll also provide students with a machine translated format of the document. So we'll translate uh, that document into 50 different languages. And so of course it's machine, transler machine translation. So uh, you know, accuracy can be an issue with, with certain types of content, but for those international students, second language learners, maybe struggling with the content uh, in, the, in the language that it's been provided by the instructor, as a starting point to accessing and understanding that content, we'll provide a machine translated format. And so those are uh, just a sampling of the alternative formats that we provide for students so that they have some choice in their course workflow in the LMS to choose a format that's gonna work best for their need and for their device. But of course, automation only takes us so far. There's only so much that machine learning and artificial intelligence can do to really generate high quality alternative formats. It's always gonna be somewhat dependent on the original and in particular, the accessibility of the original. And so optimizing those multiple formats still requires some human intervention, like adding description to images or adding an appropriate heading structure to a document. And so accessibility and usability really in this world of personalized learning and learning preference really are tied hand in hand. So thinking about the accessibility issues and improving those issues can really have a direct effect on the quality of the alternative formats that students have access to. And we know from the research that accessibility issues can impact learner engagement and performance. I referenced a study here that looked at non-disabled users' engagement with more accessible websites versus less accessible websites. And what they found on those more accessible websites was that students retained, or sorry, the, the, the study participants retained more information and they completed tasks more quickly. And so if we apply that kind of find, finding to uh, content in the learning management system, let's say that scanned PDF, uneven margins, blotchy font, it's going to be distracting, it's going to be uneasy to read, it could ultimately hurt how well those students perform. And so to help instructors fix some of these accessibility issues with their original course content, we provide our instructor feedback. It's inline feedback to address those issues. So right as soon as an instructor uploads a file into their course, Ally will scan it against the WCAG AA standards, and it's going to assign a score to that, to that item based on how well it meets uh, those, those standards. And so next to their course, they'll see a little Ally indicator, and when they click on that indicator, they're going to get robust feedback about what the issue is, why the issue affects accessibility and usability, and how to fix that content. 
In this case, we're looking at a uh, PowerPoint file. It's got uh, text with insufficient contrast. Ally has actually previewed that file in the browser, identified where those issues live, and guiding the, the instructor towards fixing those issues. Things like images that are missing description or documents that are missing headings. It's gonna identify those scanned PDF. So really trying to provide the instructors with both the awareness about the accessibility issues with their content as well as the the step-by-step -step tutorials and directions and how to fix those issues. We also just released our instructor course report. So with our instructor facing course report, the instructor can actually launch a, a little LTI tool within their course and they get really uh, robust insights about what is the file content in their courses. So how many PDFs, how many images, how much HTML. They're going to get a list of all of the different accessibility issues with those files and really uh, some some insight into how to prioritize, how to make fixes to those files, again, with the idea being that by making some of these fixes, they're going to improve the quality of the alternative formats, improve the quality of the original, and provide those students with a better experience with their content. And so the message to faculty, as opposed to accessibility, kind of being, you know, purely from a compliance perspective or from a legal perspective, it really becomes a student success story about how can we enable and, and really empower learner preference to, to improve how students engage with their content. Um, but of course, I think faculty still need some help, even with the tutorials faculty are time pressed, some of accessibility challenges are, are more difficult to fix than others. So how can we support those faculty from an institutional level, um, especially given the extent of the current accessibility issues? We did a data study at Blackboard. We looked at 21 million files. And here's just a sampling of what we saw in the LMS in terms of barriers to access and accessibility issues. You know, almost 13% of, of PDFs being scanned. 45% being untagged, lots of images missing description. So how do we as an institution start to work with faculty to address these issues at scale, given that we're talking about tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of content items in the learning management system. And so what we provide for administrators is our institutional report. It's really a data informed way to approach these existing barriers, existing accessibility issues. So we'll provide the institution with what their uh, accessibility score looks like over time, allow them to filter, drill down to see uh, where those issues live, what kinds of issues they have. You can drill down at the course level to see you know, which courses are being impacted most by these accessibility issues to really start to put strategies in place, put resources in place, professional development in place to systematically address these issues at scale. And so uh, through these, these three uh, tools that Ally provides, the, the alternative formats, the instructor feedback, and the institutional report, we're really trying to provide a, a holistic approach to, to addressing accessibility issues to really maximize learner preference, maximize student opportunities to engage with content that works best with their particular needs. And so now I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Melissa to share a little bit about how they're driving a culture shift to inclusion at Musk in the healthcare education field. Uh, I'm gonna drive, so, so Melissa will just tell me to, to move the slides when, when needed. Thanks, John. So I'm just going to kind of give you a bit of background of MUSC. We are located in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, we have six healthcare focused colleges here. So a fairly small academic side of our healthcare center. Um, but we do have 31,000 employees at this point scattered across the state of South Carolina um, who are also learners. Um, everyone is a learner here. So although we are focusing on students and um, student kind of personalization and learning, um, we also want to think about all of our learners and how they are learning at any stage in their life um, within the healthcare realm. And so all great and well, beautiful kind of setup here, um, except that we have 
two team members um, that support the LMS and that um, myself being one of them and um, another individual who that's not our only job. And um, so digital accessibility has also kind of fallen underneath of us to, to push that initiative forward on campus. Uh, you can advance to the next slide, John. So we found that talking about UDL and accessibility on campus and personalization is all great and well, but not a lot of faculty truly understand what those topics are, or what they even mean, um, because they view learning um, the way that they learned and they view teaching the way that they taught. Um, and so they kind of view personalization as a, maybe a decrease in the rigor of the content, um, saying, you know, I have this expectation and this standard of learning, um, which I'm sure any institution uh, can kind of get behind that we have these expectations. Um, and so within healthcare, and this can be translated to any profession, there's a lot of barriers that still exist um, to kind of moving forward personalization and accessibility on our, on our campus specifically. Um, and so I think uh, it's important to kind of note that the AAMC is kind of one of the bigger um, groups within medical education. Um, they came out with a huge report in 2018 focusing on and highlighting um, the lack of support for diverse students. Um, so they know that it's out there and that it's happening. Um, not just within the education realm, but also within the clinical realm. And then um, this perception of the healthcare profession um, and many professions out there that, you know, doctors or physicians should never be sick and they should never need help or they should never be learning in a different way. So, um, so it, it's hard to get past those initial barriers that are built into the culture um, within healthcare education. You can advance the slide. So what we've done at NUSC is try to shift that culture um, to and perception using kind of the iceberg model. So um, so we know that you know we can use hard facts all day and and really hit them with data and say this is going to change. This is a return on investment. This is this is how much time it's gonna take, the percentage you need to meet, and how you can do that. Um, but what we're find, we found more and more through conversations is that that 90% below the surface um, was, uh, was much, much stronger to holding back change on campus, um, and a lot of just unseen challenges or unanticipated challenges in conversations that we had with individuals as we were rolling out um, kind of the, our accessibility initiatives, along with bringing on Ally on campus. So what we've done is kind of taken the three points on the left-hand side and, and built our, our goals around that, even including Ally as a technology tool, um, made it more of a, a soft tool, um, something that could help with the why, that could help with the, the training that could help with um, conversations that maybe we couldn't have with every single person for faculty. So this is now personalizing the faculty experience. Um, and, and so we tried to help them understand um, that there's a diverse population out there. And by them going in and creating an inclusive um, educational environment, they were reaching more students so those students could be successful. You can advance the slide. So we've shifted and have found many, many, many stories out there um, about how people that are different or might look different um, or have different abilities being in healthcare are, are successful, um, are actually breaking barriers within their areas and doing amazing things that are not just helping um, physicians or um, dentists that have disabilities, but they're helping the whole profession. They're helping people outside of the profession in different ways that they could have never expected. Um, so personalization is really kind of taking a different role here at MUSC because it might look different, um, but we're hoping and we're trying to use these stories more, um, champions even on campus uh, that people can see the return on investment. 
you can advance the slide. So we're trying to change the culture and the processes that we have here um, uh, through utilizing some of our core values at MUSC and um, driving change with that. So our big Imagine 2020 campaign um, talks about leveraging differences and having people that are different work together. And so we know that diversity leads to inclusion and inclusion leads to innovation. And innovation is one of our core values here at MUSB. So people can get behind those ideas. They can understand that. They might not understand universal design for learning right away, but they can start to see how that conversation fits in to inclusion in the educational environment so that we can have innovation in our ideas and in the products that we develop and that the teams that we create. So, so we try to take the process of starting from the ground, starting from who we are, evaluating that to see what is the current status, what is the current kind of feeling across campus, identifying our gaps. Um, we know that there are a lot of gaps um, that we all have in moving forward with um, scaling personalization, um, not only from the support end, but also from faculty having time and effort and um, willingness to do it. And then keep checking in with people. Um, so as we kind of went, we wanted to make sure that this was kind of a cyclical process. It wasn't something that we would, or a change that we would implement from the top down, but we would continue to kind of bring into conversations and, and try to understand and try to improve as we went. So we really kind of made this a journey for us. You can advance the slide. So we tried to build momentum as much as we could. And we realized that starting small for personalization was the best idea. So any UDL or accessibility efforts kind of rolling into that, um, we built into our training, we built into a strategic rollout plan, and it was all about communication for us, making sure that we were not only giving communication, but that we were also receiving communication. So focus groups, one-on-one -on -one conversations with um, really difficult faculty who just maybe didn't understand the why of why we were doing this or why this was um, a, a campus-wide effort and why we were all getting behind this. Um, why does it look like this? Why are we having to invest time and effort into this when I don't have time and effort to invest into this? And so those small conversations, I think, really built up because getting that buy-in was kind of a snowball effect. Once you can talk to one individual about it, we found that they were telling their colleagues and their colleagues were telling their colleagues. Um, and so that's kind of how we started this conversation about two years ago. You can advance the slide. So this is where we brought in Blackboard Ally onto campus. And we realized that we needed it for a lot of different reasons, but at the core of it, it was about personalizing the experience for students. It was about allowing them to utilize content in the best way for them. And that brought about so many stories for us that we could not even anticipate of the usage and the way that they were using it. So our students um, are downloading MP3s so that they can listen to their content while sitting in the terrible Charleston traffic getting to class. Um, or while they're going for a run, they're, or we had a lot of people um, interested in downloading EPUBs so that they could put them on their tablets and take them on planes with them while they were um, going to clinical sites or to interviews for residencies. So we know that our students are on the go and our students need content in different ways um, and are leveraging technology to use content in different ways. So that was a really big piece for us. But Ally also brought a lot of different unknowns for us that were surprising and wonderful. <laughs> um, so the instructor gauge, uh, like Don was talking about, where instructors can go in, get that immediate feedback to remediate issues. Again, going back to the beginning, we have a team of two and it was 
It's impossible to reach everybody with the hundreds of thousands of pieces of content that we had in our learning management system. So we needed a way that instructors could get just in time help. And this really helped them um, and almost gamified the experience for us, which was great. Um, we had a go green campaign, which is kind of the pinnacle of um, ally, you want to go from red to orange to green, and we wanted everybody to go green. Um, so our instructors kind of took ally and were able to, in their place, in their time, in their space, um, remediate those issues that were important to them, and then follow up with us if they had any additional questions or issues. Then at the institutional level, we were able to drive targeted coaching, have amazing reports and data that came out of Ally for us to be able to show growth. Um, being at a research institution, um, data is very important to us to drive what we do and how we do it. Um, so this was able to provide data to us so that we could, uh, we could really target what we were doing and, and also um, share what we were doing with the different areas and how they were doing. You can advance the slide. So we had a lot of anxieties when we rolled out at Blackboard Ally on campus. Um, first of all, data. Data is a really sensitive topic. And so now putting that data in the hands of users and what's the number do I, that I need to meet? Um, how, what is compliance? What does that look like? There's so many different pieces to this. Um, so data is a really big piece to ally, and it's something that we've really struggled with here at MUSC, but are working forward with so that individuals can feel more comfortable that this isn't about the gotcha tool. This is about an empowerment tool. That's all that we're using it for. This data is not going to be used against you. It's going to be used for you. Also with updating content, so they started to see I have a lot of red in my course, and I don't have the time and effort to update all of this content right now. Um, so we had to ease those anxieties and make sure that we were working with individuals and, um, and give them personalized plans so that they could move forward with small chunks, small doable chunks within their course. Um, and then the downloading the content was very nerve wracking for many faculty because they didn't quite understand that how students were using things in different ways. So it's almost a re-education of how their students are learning um, that was really driven by the student need um, to be able to learn in these ways. You can advance the slide. So all of these challenges along the way, I, br I bring back the iceberg model because I think that this is helpful to think through as you think about what are those institutional instructor and student-based challenges. I'll start with the students because that's an easy one. We didn't have any. Um, our students welcomed Ally on campus. They loved it. Um, they knew that they were benefiting from it. They knew how to use it right away. There was no up uptime in training for them. They were in it and using it. It was really wonderful to see that students were, again, those stories that were coming in, just were using content in such unique ways that we didn't know was even possible. And I don't even know if they knew was possible before Ally. For the instructors, we had a low attendance at trainings um, to kind of get them excited about this or to get them moving or motivated. So, um, you know, that kind of under under the water level for the iceberg model is I don't have any students with disabilities in my class or I don't, you know, the perception again, the barriers, this is how I learn. So this is how I want to teach. Um, kind of debunking those myths one by one is really important. And then at the institutional level, just kind of making sure that people know the difference between accommodations and accessibility was really important for us so that we could start to frame the conversation differently this is what accommodations looks like. This is what accessibility looks like. This is what inclusion looks like. And this is our goal. Um, so this is where we want to be. You can advance the slide. And so for us, we really wanted to highlight some of our champions throughout the time because we had so many faculty just getting in there so excited about how green their course was. Um, but it's more than that. It was they felt empowered to go in there on their own 
and then the students were giving them feedback on how usable their content was that they could take it with them that they could do different things with them so it was a it wasn't just faculty driven it was also student driven um, so we have a lot of hard data you know above the water these are great things that um, we've done on campus and we've seen happen on campus so about a thousand within the first year of ally implementation um, instructional content was remediated 2,000 alternative formats downloaded and utilized again that first year 29 percent increase in accessibility and usability of content across all courses um, but there was a lot more cultural softer changes that were happening that were really powerful on our campus um, we just received the Blackboard Catalyst Award for Inclusive Education on the work that we've done around this. Um, we had our Go Green campaign um, that was really powerful for some faculty stepping up and doing some really amazing things with the tool. And then the wide ranges of uses for Ally. We didn't expect to hear a lot of the stories that we heard or how it was going to help them, but we realized that they were, they were using this content. Can advance the slide. So as you think about, you know, what this might personalization, what this might look like, and scaling it at your institution, um, I just thought of, you know, five quick topics that you could you could build your strategic plan around. Um, we had to not just have the tools, so not just have ally, but also sustain the why conversation. Um, so that cultural change, that 90% <laughs> underneath, making sure that we were hitting those challenges, um, keeping it in the forefront of people's minds and on agendas. And can I come talk to your department for five minutes and just talk about what's going on? Um, making sure that we were focusing in and small chunks along the way for specific units for their growth, building it into the workflow. So here's your start of the semester, um, kind of checklist, see if you can do this. Um, and then we really wanted to make sure that we were recognizing and praising hard work because this is not easy um, to implement personalization and UDL efforts and go back and remediate content that you've been using for a long time. So. Um, making sure that you're you're showing them that you see that hard work is done. You can advance. And so this is the reason why we do it. We do it for our students. That's it. for us. It was all student driven for from the cultural change to um, purchasing Blackboard Ally, implementing it, and just the use of it. It's all for the students. Personalization is for them. So um, I'm gonna stop there. Um, I think, John, we're gonna open up for questions if there are any at this point. Yep, thank you so much, Melissa. And um, I don't have a view of the chat, so if Kara or Chris Alden can uh, let us know what's going on in the chat, any questions? Yeah, uh, John and Melissa, so far there are no questions, um, but we can leave it open for a moment and see if anybody has any. All right. And if there's not, we can jump in and just look a little bit more about the data and, and some of the impact that we've been seeing. Um, looks like maybe somebody jumped in with a question. All right. Yeah, so uh, there is a question, uh, Melissa, to you from Megan Pereira. How have you communicated this to students? That's a great question. So. In the beginning, rolling this out, um, we actually didn't do any direct communication to students. Um, so we've had, we, we figured we really wanted faculty to have some time to remediate their content before um, we pushed the alternative formats for students. Um, we were kind of communicating this through our diversity and inclusion office. Um, if there was a need for specific students, um, but in the broader scale, we weren't doing that. However, this fall, we are doing a big push for students because we want them to see how the different formats can impact them. So what you can do with an EPUB and what that really means. Um, 
what does a tagged PDF even mean? So many of our students are tech savvy, but um, they might not know all of the use cases for these different formats. So just kind of opening up that conversation this fall um, is really important for us. So we're doing that through kind of quick newsletters and videos um, that we'll send out to students um, through an online course for them. All right, and it looks like we've prompted a couple of other questions from that one in the chat. Uh, Follow-up question, asking about what kinds of benchmark data is available, and then similarly, if you could talk more at a higher level from an analytics perspective that shows how students are using the Ally tools. Yeah, so in, in terms of, of analytics and, and what Ally provides, so you know, I mentioned the institutional report and that's, that's really focused on the accessibility issues with content across the LMS. So we're talking about PDF files, Word documents, PowerPoint files, um, HTML content that's created in the WYSIWYG editors, embedded YouTube videos that are, um, have auto captions that haven't been manually edited. So those are the kinds of checks that we provide there. So you can do benchmarking and tracking at the issue level. You can do it at the course level. So if you want to drill down at a particular course to see progress within that course in terms of instructor file fixing, you can see that as well in the institutional report. Uh, we provide an export of that data, so a CSV export, where uh, if you want to uh, do prod, uh, tr you know, tracking there or, or hook that into another visualization platform like Tableau, uh, you can do that. Uh, then in terms of our usage data that we track, and currently the usage data for Ally is available uh, to our, our partners on, on request. So will deliver this data to you. It will become part of the institutional report. It's a high priority roadmap item. But in that usage data, you can see uh, what are the total number of alternative formats that have been downloaded. Uh, you can see a breakdown of what alternative formats have been downloaded. So how many OCR PDFs have been downloaded? How many uh, tagged PDFs have been downloaded? So tagged PDF is actually our most popular download by students. So the tagged PDF is provided when a native Word or PowerPoint file has been uploaded. So let's say a student is at home, they're on a machine maybe that doesn't have Microsoft Office. Instructor has uploaded a PowerPoint file. They can get that tagged PDF file. It's also great uh, to encourage instructors to upload the content in the original native file format because a lot of times when instructors export to the PDF, they don't retain some of the accessibility features. And so encouraging them to upload it in the native file format makes it easier for remediation teams to fix that content for students who may have specific accommodations, knowing that students can always get a tagged PDF when they need to. Uh, so you can get a breakdown of the types of alternative formats that have been downloaded, as well as which courses those alternative formats have been downloaded in. Uh, Ally doesn't uh, keep any student identifiers, so you can't link the usage of those alternative formats to any individual students, uh, but you can look at it at the course level. And then Ally will also provide your usage data around instructor file fixes, so you can see um, how many times instructors click on the Ally indicator, how often they proceed to go ahead and, and make a fix to those files, um, as well as which courses those fixes are happening in. And, and I can certainly, I'll show you a little bit about what those numbers look like as we make our way through some of the more uh, questions here. Great. Uh, another follow-up question directed towards Melissa. Uh, can you speak to how faculty have responded to the differences between accommodation and accessibility? And also, if you could speak a little bit to what the environment was like on campus before Ally came along. So I think both of these questions are actually good to answer together. Um, the faculty response to the differences between accommodations and accessibility has still been um, difficult to um, to define for a lot of individuals. I think 
um, many of our instructors, um, like in many professions, aren't trained in um, teaching or legal higher ed um, issues, so they um, might not know the ins and outs of accommodations. So training them about the differences between the two, um, we've really had to partner with our uh, diversity office that does our ADA accommodations um, and and make sure that they are there for conversations as well. So it's not just the teaching and learning office driving this conversation, but it's also those that are, are helping with accommodations um, that are driving this. And so before Ally, a lot of those conversations were happening on campus, but we didn't see a lot of action because we didn't have tools in place to really make it possible um, to actually have any action on this is what accessibility looks like and this is how you go through to make your content accessible. We didn't even know, you know, really where we stood uh, in terms of the uh, um, kind of amount of work ahead of us if we were um, even working towards compliance at any point. So a lot of conversations were happening before Ally. Once Ally came onto campus, um, we kind of came in early on Ally and were only able to see the institutional reporting. And since the um, instructor facing reports have come out, we've actually built a lot of our plan this fall and spring around um, utilizing Ally and the personalization for the faculty that this provides in terms of um, here's your data um, and here's what you need to work on right now. Um, I saw there was another question about uh, if it can show growth uh, or I increase my accessibility of my course by 20%. Um, from what I understand, it does not. It's a kind of a point in time um, accessibility score. Um, so there isn't a way to kind of show like you've, you know, you've gained three stars this week and, and have upped your score this much. Um, I wish that maybe they would put that in because that would be a wonderful feature to kind of show an uptick. Um, however, uh, we do on our end uh, audits where we are pulling the data consistently so that we can see growth when we do interventions like this across campus to see, did it work? Did anybody do anything? And has any change been made? Um, so from the institutional reporting side, we do um, the data collection so that we can, we can be sure to track what we've done. So that's an important piece that we had to build in when we brought on Ally that we had to consistently pull data because at that point in time, um, sort of look at it. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were showing growth, hopefully, um, through, through, the, through the remediation that was happening. And, uh, and maybe while we, we have a bit of a break here, I'll just, and, and we have a few minutes left, I'll just run through a little bit of what, of what some of that data looks like um, and, and just some of the stories that we have seen. And, and so what's that impact look like? You know, in tracking alternative format usage, a uh, little over a year, we, we saw over 2 million downloads of the alternative format. So really cool to see and think about, I mean, over 2 million times a student making a conscious decision about how they want to engage with their learning materials, uh, really fostering that sense of autonomy and choice, um, and really not just students downloading the alternative formats. I, I, sh I should clarify also, in some cases, faculty or institutions using the alternative formats as a remediation tool. So, you know, being able to take an HTML uh, format downloaded from, from a scanned document and use that to, to uh, fix up the accessibility issues with that document. So we really see a lot of diverse usage of the alternative formats, which which is really cool. Um, when we just think about some student stories, you know, I got to talk to a student, uh, Juliana, at um, Atlantic Cape Community College in New Jersey. Uh, she's low vision. Uh, for her being able to download the HTML format, zoom really close in on that. She typically uses screen magnification software or, or, or physical tools. So the HTML for her uh, is key for that nice zoom in and still maintaining high readability legibility of that document. 
but also for her, she talks about not just making it more accessible in terms of vision, but also just in terms of as she moves from device to device, you know, from computer lab computer to her tablet to her phone, she saves the HTML in her browser. She can access it anytime, anywhere without having to download and upload files. Uh, Andrew Fong at uh, UC Berkeley, he's a graduate student there. Uh, he's a student who has some uh, processing challenges. He has some, some learning disabilities. He relies uh, on a Kurzweil uh, so that he can uh, listen to content as, and, and read it at the same time. And so for him, you know, he relies on a, a PDF, you know, being OCR, being able to, to work with, with screen reader technologies. And he talks about how oftentimes instructors will make a last minute change to the syllabus or, or put, you know, provide a supplementary reading that may not be totally accessible. And the alt media team doesn't have the time to turn around and provide him uh, with the content that will work with his Kurzweil. And so he actually now he can download an OCR PDF or, or an HTML content and use that with his assistive technologies. It's just helping him feel like a more independent learner. Um, and then we have another student, Angus, uh, who does use a screen reader, and, and he talked about actually that, you know, hearing fatigue and, and being able to switch to, to the tactile Braille and use that electronic Braille uh, document. So really cool to hear these stories about students who have disclosed disabilities, but also a student uh, uh, like this student at Chico State University, commuter student. Uh, she's a single mother. She spent a lot of time going back and forth to campus struggling to stay on top of her schoolwork for her, downloading that MP3, being able to listen to the content during her commute. It's just really helped her stay on track um, and, and, and you know, help her be successful in higher education. Again, not somebody who has a disability, but somebody you know, who has a life circumstance, who has a unique need that can really benefit from that, from that learner preference. Um, can also think about it again just in terms of that metacognitive behavior in terms of scaffolding study skills not just selecting one format all the time but actually you know using different formats to scaffold different kinds of study habits so starting off by skimming a tagged pdf on the desktop getting a high level understanding of the text uh, then moving to the epub on a tablet where you're highlighting annotating question asking really engaging those deep reading practices and then finishing off that learning sequence by listening to on the phone engaging that different sensory modality uh you know reviewing and, and things like that and so again, becoming a conscious chooser about your learning preferences, what works best for you, and what ultimately helps you achieve your goals as a learner. Um, you know, uh, Melissa talked a little bit about, about uh, faculty response, and, and we hear just time and time again, institutions, they, at first there's some anxiety, be, uh, anxiety about how will faculty respond to the presence of the indicators in the course, how will they respond to accessibility, and really it seems to be overall uh, something that faculty respond pretty well with, as long as there's some consistent messaging there, some expectations about how to move forward, uh, faculty, you know, see it as a social justice issue and again as we paint the picture that accessibility best practices can really have an impact and benefit all learners I think it's, it's really helping to, to drive faculty buy-in and and help them start to you know make those simple fixes to their accessibility issues um, in in again about a little over a year we saw over 360,000 files uh, fixed or altered by instructors through allies instructor feedback window so you know clicking on that indicator and, and actually going ahead and, and making a fix. 37% um, of the time, they, they actually click on the indicator and proceed to try to alter that content. So, you know, it starts by building awareness, what are the issues, but, you know, I think at a, at a pretty encouraging rate, instructors actually take action to, to try to fix the file. And 83% of the time, those fixes have resulted in an improved score. So, you know, leveraging that feedback, those tutorials, that step-by-step -step guidance, and actually seeing some success. And, um, you know, Melissa pointed to it, and, and we've heard it from, you know, her faculty in, in a video, how encouraging it is to see the indicator go green. It really motivates them. It, it gives them that incentive to, to keep going. And, and, you know, when you combine that with an institutional strategy that's supporting them with some of the more challenging issues, I think a great example uh, um, at, at Melissa's 
institution there they also work closely with the library uh, to identify and, and help you know link to to the library database as opposed to uploading you know untagged PDFs or scanned PDFs so there's just great opportunities to really connect the campus um, in terms of scale We've now checked over 620 million files for accessibility issues. Um, so those are files living in the LMS um, that we're checking. And, and so from a machine learning perspective, you know, we are, our improvements in how we understand that content, how we're generating those alternative formats uh, has just really grown leaps and bounds in, in the past year as, as more institutions have adopted Ally. Over 600 institutions now are are using Ally as part of their inclusive education initiatives. Um, and as I mentioned, when you have that institutional reporting, when you have that kind of data in insight, you're really bringing together various pieces of a campus that, you know, departments that may not have been in conversation with each other. So, you know, you can think LMS admins and library services and disability support, instructional designers, even marketing teams now. We have institutions who are creating course shells for their marketing team so that they can check content through Ally before they push it out to public websites or, or other public facing uh, domains. And so, you know, really galvanizing uh, that campus wide commitment to inclusion, I think is something uh, really exciting and, and cer certainly something that Melissa uh, talks about at, at the Medical University of South Carolina. So uh, I looks like we have a couple minutes left. Any last questions? But definitely, if you're interested, uh, I encourage you to join our user group community, usergroup.ally.ac. It's become a vibrant community uh, for advocacy around inclusive education, uh, both talking about Ally as a product, but also just generally thinking about best practices. Um, we share a lot of resources and case studies there, ongoing research. Um, so a great place to, to kind of get involved with, with our community. Um, any uh, last questions as we start to, to wrap it up? Yeah, John and Melissa, I think there are two final questions. Uh, one uh, for you, John, uh, and also perhaps for you, Melissa, as well. Related to the alternative formats, how effective is OCR to convert those scanned PDFs to proper PDFs? And are those converted PDFs tagged or do the instructors need to tag them separately? Yeah, so, you know, of course, uh, OCR, the quality of the output is always going to be somewhat dependent on the quality of, of the original scan. And, and so uh, we use an over the text OCR. So, so we're going to try to clean up that font a little bit, um, you know, but, but again, it, there, there is a dependency on, on the, the quality of the original scan. We'll do our best. Um, you know, Abby Fine Reader is a state of the art OCR engine. So, you know, we're deploying, you know, top of the line technologies to try to, to, to do that OCR and perform the OCR. But yeah, there are certainly limitations to that. Um, Ally uh, will, uh, in, in generating the alternative formats, it, it will uh, do some tagging there. Um, if you were to take an OCR PDF from Ally and replace the original, Ally will ask you as, as a user to add a heading structure there. So it, it's not going to make it uh, entirely accessible. There is some work to be done. Uh, from that OCR. And so actually that's one of the use cases that, that we have seen where institutions as opposed to uh, trying to do that, you know, adding that heading structure in Adobe Acrobat Pro, downloading Ally's HTML format, dropping that into a Word document and adding headings there. And so for institutions that may not have a, a pro license for all of their faculty available, that's actually a great way to really improve the, the quality of, of the remediation and make that a little bit easier for the faculty. All right, and uh, Melissa, related to PDFs, do you expect faculty to make all of the accessibility fixes that Ally recommends, including making the PDFs more accessible? That's a great question. So we, we have this conversation, I think, daily on what is, what's the magic number to meet? Um, and uh, of course, a hundred percent is the magic number. Um, but John has a lot of information on the way that Ally actually scores documents. So it, it can fluctuate depending on the course that it's in, the, um, the impact that it could have. Um, so what we say is just try to work towards, um, a hundred percent, um, of course. Uh, and if, if you can't get to that, 
um, at least address those big issues that will help you jump to, um, to a higher percentage. So those issues that make the, the document usable or not usable, basically. Um, if it's the smaller issues that you can't fix, um, we can work with them and normally help them work that out in some sort of way, or it might be delivering the content in a whole different way. Um, we found that using different techniques um, can help get it to 100% or whatever that magic number is. Um, so, so it might just be rethinking the way that the content is delivered. Okay, it looks like we've reached the end of our time here for our session. I'd like to thank our speakers, John and Melissa, very much for um, the great information that you've shared. I'd like to thank all of our attendees for being here and for your excellent questions. Um, I want to remind you that you will get a follow-up email um, within a day uh, directing you to the recording of today's webinar, and we hope you'll join us uh, for future webinars. So thank you and have a great rest of your day.